Standing in the whispering gallery of St. Paul's Cathedral, some 30 meters above the church floor below, it's hard not to look down at the hundreds of people who bustle through here every day. It's a dazzling sight, but one that's perhaps equaled by what hangs above us. Painted in the cathedral's iconic dome is one of the most famous works of one of England's greatest artists. 300 years ago, James Thornhill was awarded the commission to execute his paintings on the life of the Apostle Paul on the dome's interior. In this video, I'll be giving you some historical background to Thornhill's paintings in the dome, as well as a bit of information about some of the objects in the cathedral's collection which relate to his work. In the late stages of construction on Sir Christopher Wren's masterpiece, built in the wake of the Great Fire of London in 1666, Wren was ordered by the Building Committee of the Royal Commission to take designs and proposals for the painting of the dome. Originally, Wren had desired the dome to be covered in mosaic tiles by Italian artisans, but this idea was rejected by the committee. The Church of England, in an attempt to distance itself still further from the traditions of the Roman Catholic Church, was sceptical of anything it considered to be decadent or popish, particularly in regards to design. By March 1709, the Commission had resolved itself to the use of figurative paintings in the dome, but only those related to biblical history, and specifically, that taken from the Acts of the Apostles. This was skirting a fine line, but the general feeling was that figures of the saints could be used in an instructional manner, as long as they were not directly intended as figures of worship. By February of the next year, a competition had taken place, and the committee had narrowed down their choices to two artists, Antonio Pellegrini and James Thornhill. Both submitted models of their designs, and then waited for the committee's decision. That decision would not come for another five years. There's no known reason for the length of the delay, but politics may have at least been partly to blame. The Commission was, for much of this time, made up mostly of members of the Whig Party, who took issue with the politics of Christopher Wren, a noted and outspoken Tory. There was frequent gridlock, and in retrospect it is unsurprising that the members were slow to move on many of Wren's proposals. Then also there was the issue of the nature of the paintings themselves. With their strong views on idolatry and the worship of figures outside the Trinity, the reluctance of a conservative committee to approve a bold figurative scheme promoting the works of an apostle would have taken some serious negotiation to overcome. Finally, on the 28th of June, 1715, a commission newly appointed by the recently crowned King George I elected James Thornhill to paint the dome, fulfilling Archbishop Thomas Tennyson's earlier insistence, first, that the painter employed must be a Protestant, and second, that he be an Englishman. Thornhill produced a series of eight watercolour sketches, which are stored here in the architectural archive of the cathedral. They give a good indication of the direction in which he would eventually go for his final work on the dome. Each of these eight scenes that Thornhill painted depicts a moment from the life of St. Paul, the apostle for whom the cathedral is named. The scheme of these paintings is a style known as grisé, a technique often used in decorative artwork as an imitation of stonework or sculpture. The cathedral's royal commission was wary about any decoration which might be considered ostentatious or too similar to the brightly coloured Catholic churches of the continent. This austere monochrome was a far safer alternative. The historical nature of these paintings was also calculated to appeal to the conservative members of the commission. These paintings behind me on the wall of the cathedral's chapter house are a later set done by Thornhill in preparation for his work at the cathedral and are nearly identical in staging to the final works on the cathedral's cupola. These oil paintings do a marvellous job of demonstrating the action and dynamism of the final scenes. The four stories depicted here are the conversion of Paul, the shipwreck at Malta, the sermon at Athens and the jailer of Philippi. The themes that are presented in these examples of Thornhill's work heavily reflect the attitudes of the Church of England at the time and give a good explanation for their inclusion in the cathedral. Take, for example, this first scene, taken from Acts 9, in which Saul hears the word of the Lord and is blinded by divine light before being converted to Christianity. Through the 17th century, England underwent massive governmental and religious shifts. By the time that James Thornhill was commissioned in 1715, the conflict had subsided, 
but church leaders found great solace and inspiration in the experiences of St. Paul. For them, his enduring a period of false faith, blindness, and a subsequent acceptance into the true religion mirrored the difficult and costly split of England from Catholicism. Paul's subservience to the law in Philippi, but not to its corrupt and unjust executors, also furnished an example for the people of London to strive towards, justifying, in a sense, the multiple monarchic overthrows of the previous century. When the time finally came for Thornhill to accept his commission and begin his work, the problems became less liturgical and more logistical. The space inside the dome is such that, in order to actually paint his scenes on the cathedral cupola, Thornhill would have had to design and build a scaffold on which he could stand, free in the air, some 50 metres above the cathedral floor. Unfortunately, we don't have his designs for the scaffold, but we do have those of Edmund Paris, the 19th century artist who was commissioned by the cathedral to restore Thornhill's paintings in the 1850s. Paris designed, built and worked from this tiered scaffold, which was held aloft by pulleys and cables drawn through the oculus at the top of the cupola. Using this design, he was able to perform his work from every angle that he and his assistants required, slowly cleaning and retouching their way around the inside of a dome which is more than 30 metres in diameter. Though we may never really know for sure, it's quite likely that Thornhill found a similar solution to the problem of reaching his lofty canvas. During the Victorian era, James Thornhill's achievement was considered out of fashion, and there were plans to replace it with mosaics by Francis Penrose, similar to those which now glint in the choir and on the pendentives of Wren's iconic dome. Personally though, knowing the history and symbolism of Thornhill's work, I can't help but be glad that they didn't. If you take the opportunity to visit St. Paul's, look up. Take in the striking, dynamic poses of the figures who gaze out from seemingly three-dimensional spaces. Notice the gilding along the architectural portions of the paintings. See how they leap forward against the somber, academic nature of the historical figures. In the context of the times, the intention becomes clear to avoid idolatry while still awing and inspiring those who gaze upon it. That it can still have the same effect on me 300 years later is truly remarkable.